Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Paul and other organizers for inviting me. Um, it's, the program looks fantastic. You, you must have had a really good week, um, past week and ahead of you. Um, I will start my talk by motivating um, the perspective of looking into internal models. So um, I use brain imaging and I will also highlight different techniques um, ranging from single cell recordings up to a uh, whole entire um, human brain mapping. But with the question, um, what is the best strategy to understand brain mechanisms? So if we go, go back into history in psychology, we started out, psychology started out by trying to understand um, the brain uh, in, in, in a way of reverse engineering, but uh, by not assuming any kind of structure and internal, uh, internal models. Um, and, and if you like, the, the behaviorist looked at uh, the, the brain as a vending machine in which you have an, a clear input-output relation. You, you, you put money in and you get something out. And by ex designing interesting experiments, you get to this point to understand what kind of components need to be in, in this machinery inside. You know, then there needs to be some coin recognition. And, uh, um, and um, this was then followed by... Um, um, by, co by the cognitive turn in which uh, mental processes and internal representations became much more important. Um, and whereas in behaviorism it makes no sense, for example, to investigate imagery or mental time travel or uh, these totally internal processes because they have no, they have no direct behavioral output. Um, but they are extremely important for understanding um, brain mechanisms. So um, mental processes such as uh, attention, imagery, mind wandering um, be become interesting or researchable using uh, cognitive terms and, and we started a bag of new terminology to capture these kind of uh, internal processes, memory, perception, problem solving, creativity, thinking and so on. And that left us with a lot of different fields uh, that could be investigated, but that didn't lend itself to a unifying theory, if you like. And um, maybe in the last 20 years, 1990s, but, but certainly in the, in the last couple of years, um, a, a new kind of framework is starting to, um, to emerge, which is studying the um, brain under the framework of a free energy principle or the idea that um, it has one main purpose and the main purpose, is, it's, it's evolutionary prepared to, to optimize, is to re reduce um, surprise and to reduce prediction error and to have, so to say, a general purpose machiner machinery that has created different internal tricks and bags and to solve those problems specific for the environment in which um, the, 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 the different um, biological uh, beings exist. So um, now there are different terminologies, not so much related to, the, to just the function or to uh, different, um, you know, different internal processes, but um, the it, 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 it tries to create a parsimonious explanation of brain processes with terminologies of internal model, hierarchy, prediction error, reduction, precision of predictions, and so on. And um, there's some debate, and we'll, we'll touch upon this, how um, predictive processing framework has revolutionized existing uh, neuroscience or is just finding new terminology around it. But I'm motivating this a little bit to, to also say, well, finding a parsimonious explanation might be a, um, um, already a very important goal to find the right kind of paradigms to in, in investigate. And um, to motivate this a little further, um, imagery, for example, in this study, you have, uh, in this study, there's absolutely no input-output. Um, Adrian Owen uh, studied patients in a, in, in, in a vegetative state 
uh, and uh, ask them to do an imagery task, um, to, to, to imagine to play tennis, and uh, you have the control subjects, uh, playing tennis was one, or walking about a room um, in, <coughs> in, in their house, and uh, by comparing the brain activity that is related to those cognitive imagery tasks, um, you could infer that those patients are able to understand the instructions and to follow the instructions even though there's absolutely no behavior. These, these patients um, um, look as if they are not conscious and, and, and uh, have only minimal conscious states. I'm not going to go into the details because I'm not an expert, but I find this exper example uh, very um, uh, illustrative to this point that in this case you're able to just compare the um, brain activity. And um, also another example of uh, a technique that I will be using, which is kind of brain reading technology, um, but I will use an example if it runs from uh, Tim Mitchell. Uh, this has been highlighted in uh, a US TV show, CBS, 60 Minutes, and um, so Tim is explaining the, the experiment. So uh, there's a there's a so um, um, the yeah. So this is a stimulus. Subject sees the the different objects, and um, the analysis is trained on. Um, 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 on taking the brain activity and making uh, guesses without knowing the subject before. So that's, that's a very um, surprising and interesting aspect here. Uh, the, um, uh, the computational model that is trained on uh, a group of subjects is able to recognize the kind of uh, images the subject has been seen, but this is made a little bit easy by uh, making a, a forced choice uh, decision. So the computer is asked, is this a hammer or a knife? And uh, by using the brain activity, uh, it gets it right all the, uh, like 10 out of 10 times, and it's demonstrated online and on TV, which hasn't done before. And so the, the subject goes in, and the brain activity is read you know, simultaneously. So in a way, um, yeah, so they're quite happy, and they, you know, says, of course, um, we don't stop there. We're going to read more things out of the brain. Uh, what's interesting here is that uh, the um, computational um, model is follows with some other research um, is trained um, across a group of subjects and then apply to, to a new subject that can purely by um, adjusting the size um, to, to Talar coordinates. And um, it also shows how similar the brain activity can be for the different subjects to do this kind of brain reading. Right? Um, and the um, architecture, if you like, has been developed um, simultaneous, has been similar across, not only across different humans, but also across species. The kind of uh, unifying um, architecture that has developed came up with the six layer cortex, which is similar across various species, which allows us to do multi scale, multi species uh, neuroscience, which I, I will come to, to later on. Um, but the question is, um, what, what evolution came up, what is the kind of uh, strategy that is so powerful to, to make us being able uh, to succeed in, in the various environment and to pre predict our environment successfully? And um, the um, co-evolution of um, uh, uh, um, artificial intelligence, so to say, came in 2014 to a good uh, solution for the visual system, deep encoding, uh, deep convolutional neural networks, for example, um, that um, have not tried to mimic this kind of architecture that lives, uh, that um, has developed in, um, in, in biology, 
um, but purely by coming up with, with an architecture that is very efficient in doing these, these kind of tasks. Um, the visual hierarchy um, in these deep encoding networks as well as in humans or animals um, that we know very well of course uh, starts with, with simple features that become more and more complex as we go through the visual hierarchy. So this is the standard textbook um, um, way of uh, depicting the uh, particular architectural hierarchy that has developed in the visual system. And um, it has, a, same as deep encoding networks, a feed-forward architecture. That's the, the, um, the, the, the standard kind of drivers of feed-forward connectivity. It gets more and more complex to then drive to get a, a, a complex representation of the outside world. What's less well understood and well studied is the reverse um, direction, the feedback connections, what are the purposes of the feedback connections, and um, if you like, um, the internal models that are triggered at the higher hierarchy, how are they influencing, how are they feeding back to the, to, to, to the early uh, sensory input? How are they interacting? And that's something that I study in various paradigms. Um, in early 1990s, David Mumford is one of the forefathers of the predictive framework or the predictive um, processing revolution. And he said, um, he proposed a role for reciprocal topographic cortical pathways in which higher areas send abstract predictions of the world to lower cortical areas. So lower areas attempt to reconcile the reconstructions of its view that it receives from higher areas with what is, uh, what is known. So it is kind of uh, uh, the, the internal models um, have some kind of representation of world knowledge and use this world knowledge to um, make predictions and um, see how good these predictions are to then um, create better internal models. So, um, in David Mumford not only proposed this concept of an active blackboard, but also in kind of architecture, how that is possible in the six-layered um, cortex. So which layers receive the feedback? These are the t these errors, the top layers, and the bottom, um, uh, the, the, the deepest layers, whereas the feed-forward input comes uh, into the mid-layers. And we will use ultra-high resolution fMRI to investigate the kind of information that is passed forward in these different layers of cortex. Um, the active blackboard idea is a very attractive one. So you have all these expert areas um, that then send their feedback back to, to um, uh, lower regions in the hierarchy. And um, so to say, give their estimate uh, as on a, on a, on a blackboard uh, for a um, particular time, that's why it's active. So let's say the motion areas draw some prediction that something is happening in a certain region, and, uh, and that's the case. And uh, the object areas give you some information about objects um, that they have analyzed, so uh, people in the room, room information, and that decays over time. And so that's, that's what makes it an active blackboard. Different areas converge to project their predictions uh, down to, to, to an area where, uh, to, to a projection zone like primal visual cortex, where then they are overlaid and decay over time. And there, the predictions are tested. Now, in a way, this is the only way in which an internal model that is totally disconnected from the outside world can learn something about the, uh, the outside world, because that is the, the, the kind of challenge the brain has to come up with. Um, to, to, to create, for example, if you have an object that is dropped, the sound of it, uh, the environment you interact with, um, to, become, to get an internal model, a representation of this outside world, you can only do this um, by optimizing your internal models to the, to, to the currency of reducing prediction error. So you, you make an expectation that if I drop something, it will have a certain sound, 
And if that is fulfilled, then I have a useful, uh, useful internal models. I can have many, many different internal models, but only those ones that are really successful are the ones that then survive. And we have from uh, brain research from the lab of Uri Hasson, um, a, hi a hierarchy in the, in the visual areas that is not just complexity, in the time, uh, like features are combined, but uh, time integration. So this study used several, uh, experiment, uh, several subjects that are watching a movie, and the movie is then uh, put, cut into several pieces and put together in a random version and um, showed again to the, to the dis different subjects. And if you show a very exciting movie, like a Hollywood movie, then all the subjects will have the same brain activity um, up to the, to the red areas. Um, so the internal story that is told and every the internal models that you, you get engaged with the story is activating all those areas. If you cut it into smaller pieces, then the bigger story falls apart. Um, and But the brain activity is still similar across subjects. So this highlights the similarity across subjects in the activity. Um, and if you cut it in even smaller pieces, then everyone is starting to make up their, their, their own story, if you like. They still see the absolute same input, the same stream of, of, of images. So therefore, the blue areas are still highly correlated um, between subjects. But they, the, 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 the bigger, the green and the red areas, don't synchronize anymore because everyone is making an, you know, a, a new internal model, a new explanation of what that means. Good exciting movies keep everyone excited and up to uh, 30 seconds integration, they have the same activity. Um, so there's a hierarchy of these internal models, how far they reach. And um, the this may be a little bit basic, um, but if we um, th there's a very good explanation of the the um, the predictive mind, and um, and and some good exercises of how to frame the, um, the 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 concept of inference mechanisms in in the brain from um, Jacopoli called the predictive mind, and um, I'm just going to use an example. Uh, we don't have a sound. So, so in this example, if, if, if someone uh, listens to a, uh, so the sound is, is an ambiguous sound. It could be a, a bird singing, but it could also be a, a, a kind of a, a hammer. So it's, um, and you have the, the inference. So um, to, to kind of infer where is the sound coming from. So the, the, the evidence, um, the likelihood, how good does, is the evidence explained by this internal model? So if you have the internal model of, uh, of a bird, if you say, okay, this, this is a sound, this sound pattern could be well explained by the bird, and the hammer could be well explained, but the, the cow, uh, maybe not so much, a piano, a Formula One car, or a Martian, all of those do, um, well, they explain this evidence very, very well, um, let's say 0 0.8, um, the, the, the cow, the other animal, does not explain that very well, uh, and this doesn't explain it at all. But you could have a, a, a Martian that is trying to mimic you and to trick you and to make the sound of a hammer, and that would actually explain this sound, or the, the, the sound of a bird, extremely well. And uh, so the likelihood the, is the explanation of those, um, uh, of, of the sound. And um, the um, priors are your background beliefs, like how like how how um, uh, how likely uh, how probable is it that um, you know in the current room you are sitting where the window is open that there's actually a bird in front of your your window or a hammer uh, or a cow or a Formula One car. Um, or, you know, you believe that there's a Martian trying to trick you, uh, you have pr probably very low priors to, to, um, to, uh, to think that that is very probable. 
And so in this Bayesian framework, you come to the conclusion the perception solves this by having an internal model that kind of win wins. The posterior is, um, uh, you know, selecting that there's probably a, a, a bird outside. So you're optimizing these kind of uh, uh, Bayesian framework, uh, your internal models, to try to explain the, um, the evidence that your sensory areas are, are perceiving. Um, and once you have a hierarchy, the hierarchy can expand over time and the hierarchy can, so you're trying to, so this was an example of just a, a, a sound that is repeated, beep, 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 so a few seconds. But if you try to explain uh, behavior of um, people, w w once you try to uh, explain um, a um, uh, longer um, occurrence of features, movies, storylines, humor, language, uh, you need a hierarchy of, um, of these internal models that, kind, that can expand longer over time. So now let's start to do some, some brain imaging research that finds evidence for this. This is more, more or less a theoretical framework that was proposed. Uh, w goes back to, to Helmholtz um, and um, then uh, I mentioned David Mumford and um, Raul and Ballard in, in, in the 90s that made models of this, but um, the brain imaging and uh, electrophysiology evidence uh, came out in the last kind of 10 years or so. So we contributed some, some of that. Here's an experiment that is motivated by some of our experiments that we have done last 10 years, but um, it's um, taking it a little further. It's from a different lab. It's from uh, one Mark Shim's um, uh, lab. And it's using apparent motion as an illusion and is looking at uh, primary visual cortex and reading out primary visual cortex. So if you see this illusion, um, you have the grating that is moving up and down, um, but you also have a kind of continuous, or you can, subjects can see this kind of continuous um, um, movement of a grating and a change of the grating. So the, the grating goes uh, um, in, in, in this direction and then uh, in this direction. And so uh, in the middle, it's kind of smoothly in between. So the vertical grating is something that you can infer. It makes sense, you know, giving the environment, it's a very simple example, but giving the environment, it's, it makes sense to fit in this intermediate grating. Now, they tested this and they rotated it outwards and so on. And then they did brain reading at this non-stimulated area in V1, which is something that we pioneered, but we, had it, we did it a little bit simpler. And so they came up with this new design in which they found evidence that you create this new feature that hasn't been presented before, which is the vertical gradient. So you can read out a, a vertical gradient in this non-stimulated area in primary visual cortex. So that's kind of an evidence that higher visual areas fill in some of the features into a place that's not stimulated as a prediction. As that makes sense, that's my internal model, and uh, you can read this out in, in, in the brain activity. Here we have two versions of an apparent motion paradigm in which we present a target stimulus in the apparent motion um, trace, either in time or out of time. So these dark ones, they have all the same luminance, but yet just to illustrate, the dark ones are the ones that are in time, and the light ones are the ones that are slightly out of time. So now, uh, in this experiment, we are looking at the location of the, of the target stimulus, and um, we asked, first is a behavioral experiment, we asked the subjects to press a button whenever they see something on their apparent motion trace. And uh, what we find in, um, in controls, in apparent motion condition, but not when it's simultaneously flickering, is that um, the dark ones have an advantage. So once the, they are at, this, at the predicted time frame, then you can perceive them better than if they are a little bit outside and then they are noisy and, and the interpretation is they don't fit to the internal model. So it's more efficient. Uh, and this was done also with schizophrenic patients because there's a hypothesis that they are, have maybe a, an, an altered 
uh, internal models that are interacting differently with the with the um, uh, their processing prediction error differently and and, and don't update their internal models as efficiently to prediction errors as normal subjects. And you can imagine how that links into the, to the symptoms. So for example, um, uh, y y y you know, um, the one perception is that ideas are flowing away and um, or that are modif modified by, by others, that there's an antenna in your brain that's a schizophrenic uh, a psychotic uh, story and others would say that doesn't make sense but if they don't take in the prediction error to update their internal model it, con it, it stays, the internal model stays so to say. But um, there are of course different hierarchies, different levels and the way we tested it is maybe very basic and so the uh, psycho uh, psychotic symptoms are better explained by uh, prediction, manage prediction error management at a higher level than at an earlier level. So we're currently testing it with autism subjects, but um, this was the experiment where we tested it with schizophrenic subjects. So they have the same advantage of a predicted stimulus versus a non-predicted stimulus. These ones are better detected, um, shown here in, in dark gray, than the ones that are slightly out of time. Okay, interestingly here, we use fMRI activity induced by the blinking stimulus on the apparent motion trace, and you can see that the out of time flash is creating a stronger signal than the in time. So this is inconsistent with the idea the more activity you have in the brain measured with fMRI, the better are the subjects in detecting it. But it's consistent with if you have an internal model that is confirmed, you don't need so much brain activity and you can perceive it better. And if you have a prediction error shown in blue, then it doesn't necessarily lead to a detection but it's something that sticks in a system at this early level and is calling for an update of internal model and if the internal model is not getting enough it, um, evidence, it's not updating, it's not saying, oh, there's another flash. And um, so predictive processing gives an explanation why at a high activity um, you have, uh, you, you still can't detect it, whereas the internal model explains away activity and can better detect it in those conditions. Okay, so this is, if you like, a, the, ta the time-space plot of uh, what we think of a higher visual area, like V5. It's predicting a certain speed of, an, uh, of a dot moving, okay? So uh, in, in, in the framework that I motivated, you know, now you have this, this top-down prediction. This is uh, position, position and time. So you have a certain trajectory that is predicted, okay? And um, now this is, again, our in-time or out-of-time stimulus. Okay, so I um, think now and then you can see a target stimulus here. Or you can, it's harder to detect the target stimulus here. So that's, if you place a stimulus um, in this wave, so to say, or slightly out of this wave. Now, Paul, this is the, uh, the, the, the top-down region because this is V5, which we say, which we place in this hierarchy a little higher than V1. And uh, the advantage of detecting the in-time target stimulus is, um, is reduced if we TMS V5. So the effect of detectability is something we, we find with fMRI in V1, but the modification of this prediction is happening by stimulation of V5 with TMS. So if we TMS uh, V5, then we take, so to, so to say, this prediction effect away. How do you see this? Um, it's we do this TMS at different time points, and only at this time point it's significantly re reduced. So you have always a re replication of this in time, out of time, time frame, except in, in this condition. And this condition is the one in which it's 50 milliseconds to, it's a double TMS pulse, 50 to 13 milliseconds before the stimulus, on s b before the blinking stimulus. Okay, so now we push this further because to make it realistic in an, in an everyday environment um, where we do saccades every um, 300 milliseconds, 
um, is it, does it work that you carry over this kind of predictions over a saccade? So there's some apparent motion moving in the right visual field. You do a saccade over the stimulus. Do you carry over those predictions? Um, we would hope, it, you know, if, if you have internal models, you don't start processing after the saccade again, but you know the visual scene, you know what you have analyzed and processed already, so the predictions should carry over. Uh, if higher visual areas have internal models, they are updated about the next saccade position, and then they can project these predictions to these retinotopic areas. This is, if you like, the old um, Van Helmholtz prediction. So if we make saccades, the entire world stays stable, and we l sample different features in the space. But if we move our eye, if you take your finger and you move your eye, you see how the world is moving, because that's something your, pro your um, internal model system, V5 and, and other areas, are not updated to. So it's surprising, and the surprise is encoded in updating internal models in the, in the way that the world is moving. But um, to test this, if this internal model update really goes all the way down in the visual hierarchy to V1, we did a follow-up of our experiment in which we have again the apparent motion and this, the subjects are saccading now from right to left. So um, from green and then saccade to, to, the, to the right. And um, we scan now in the left hemisphere, which is only stimulated once after the saccade. So all the processing is happening in one hemisphere and um, then the target stimulus I'm talking about, this target stimulus is only presented once after the saccade, um, and the entire hemisphere is only, uh, the visual uh, V1 hemisphere is only stimulated once by this target, and we want to test whether it makes a difference if it's in time or out of time, predicted or unpredicted. So here's now the figure I was drawing here. So we have uh, the, the um, the target stimulus shown here in, in blue, that is just blinking once, and this is from retinotopic mapping of the inducer, and the other inducer would be down here. So those are the different patches. We make sure that this blue patch is only stimulated by stimuli presented here, and not by, uh, by presentation of, of a stimulus over here. But um, so lateral interaction is not happening in the sense that at this location, if a checkerboard, if a strong stimulus is presented here, that you would see in the event-related time course after a while a little bit of a response. That's not what we see. We don't see a positive response there. Um, but if the stimulus is presented, or if internal model predicts something is happening over this, then you see an interaction. So a static stimulus just here does not trigger a response there. But if you have a prediction something is moving over this, then there is some processing happening here. And this varies in a function of your, your predictions. So what we see here is um, interesting things. One is, if you have an apparent motion on, then you have an overall ac activation, this kind of enhancement for the illusory trace. It's something that we have shown in 2005. That was the first study we showed this. Uh, so even though this region is not stimulated, uh, so there's no blinking dot, um, you, you see this kind of uh, wave of activity. It could be lateral interaction, it could be uh, top-down influence, but it's not, f there's no feed-forward input. Um, so this is, in our interpretation, the internal model. Uh, could be feedback from V5, and there are several times that we have shown this and uh, replicated by others as well. And now, if there is a stimulus, a sample stimulus on this trace, this dot, then it gives an in, uh, additional enhancement, additional increment of activity. That's, so to say, just the response of this one flicker that's on top of that, shown in purple, if it's out of time, and shown in yellow if it's in time. So it's the increment of the blinking on top of that that is as a function of predictability. And it's the reduction from the yellow when it's predicted versus the purple when it's a bit more surprising. And this is the prediction effect, if you like. And uh, in this 
these are individual differences of these peaks, so all of those are individual subjects. Um, and, and this is the average, there are a few exceptions, but um, you see you re we replicated this in individual subjects, and that's one group, and then we replicated the, the entire uh, thing in another group, independently pre-registered. So we, what this shows is that um, the have we have evidence for the you know if you, if you like for the mechanisms involved in predictive coding is that there's top-down feedback from v5 to v1 in these conditions of motion um, that it is measured at a non-stimulated area and um, it does two things it enhances activity though this is counter to predictive coding in Rao and Ballard sense because at this we have baseline activity the internal model is creating something it's more um, it's an expectation that cr yeah creates activity at this at this point where there's no there's no feed forward input, and this created activity interacts then with the it's it's the, the test and it interacts with the with, with the test stimulus. So if it confirms, it, it's processed differently than if it's violated. And that's something um, that also uh, other labs are finding. For example. Uh, Flores de Lange is also showing this with illusory contours. So if you have these illusory contours, then at the region where these contours are created uh, by your internal model, you have an increase of activity counter to predictive coding because there's, you know, it's the internal model creates something. But then if you confirm it with the contour, you, has l you have less activity. It's, it, it's explaining something away of the overall activity if it makes a bigger figure. Then, if if the figure is uh, if the contours are not explained by the figure, so predictive processing is um, contextualized spatially, temporally, and and takes the internal model to 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 be predictive. Um, this has started uh, the, the, this kind of um, uh, um, paradigm shift, and many philosophers have um, called this a very massive shift. For example, um, Andy Clark saying, you know, you take away some of the segmentations between perception and cognition by uh, starting uh, to, to look into predictive processing uh, framework. Um, then, but it's also a question, is this really a paradigm shift in, in, uh, in other respects? So I'm just highlighting some of the uh, discussions. Um, it's of course contributing to many of the architectures of in, uh, artificial intelligence. One example is uh, Jeff Hawkins. Um, the, there's a theoretical motivation of um, that I kind of highlighted. Um, David Mumford proposed a, a certain architecture, but um, there's also a debate, and we started about this. Um, you, kn you know, the, the extreme views in which um, something is explained away as Rao and Ballard said, in which you don't have any um, um, confirmation of the prediction feeding forward, but you have a prediction and only the prediction error is feeding forward. And this is an extreme view. Um, I personally, uh, the data doesn't show that. It's a combination. We, our fMRI data shows only a, a combination of enhancing activity for predictions and then interacting with evidence that can reduce it, but it's fMRI um, data, so it doesn't say whether it is um, inhibitory or excitatory activity. And uh, so Grossberg, for example, has worked in uh, 30 years in, in, in the field. In his kind of uh, RRT networks, predictions are um, getting enhanced if they are confirmed, they resonate if they are confirmed, and um, they also have prediction error units that are local, locally and they're, they're fee for forwarding for, for um, creating an update in a template. Um, so they have comparable units, but they are kind of plugged in, 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 in a different combination. So there's also an, an idea that bias competition and prediction error um, and um, prediction, predictive coding can be assembled in different ways depending on how you put the elements of uh, um, internal models, prediction errors, and updating of predictions together. I think this is, this is an implementation discussion, but it's still showing that, you, that, the, that um, predictions are created on, um, on stimulus history, 
and interacting with new stimuli. Um, and we have um, applications in um, different um, patients that can be altered by, by um, predictive processes. Um, and now I want to move forward. So this is like predictions of a very short time frame, but actually the more interesting ones are uh, once it's about um, uh, longer time frames, so that this is like a prior motion and interacting a w within an, in a few milliseconds or seconds. Here you have predictions if you walk up an escalator that um, is your world knowledge tells you um, it should be moving, but if the escalator stops, you almost have a visceral feeling that uh, that uh, your, your prediction is um, violated, you have surprise. In humor, um, you um, have stand-up comedians that are playing with, with your expectations uh, that are built up through communication and can lead to humor. If it's absurd, if it's a total violation, it wouldn't be funny, but if it's just a little bit, that's, that's a kind of a, uh, a pleasant surprise, if you like. So you have internal models at different hierarchy that creating predictions and the uh, can be violated at different levels to then um, either update the internal model for, in the case of humor. Or so, um, and uh, so this is the kind of predictive processing framework. But I would like to um, go now forward to an example, which is the one I mentioned earlier with the cerebellum experiment. So here we are now testing um, prediction in a uh, more natural environment using these uh, uh, short movie clips. They are then broken, oops, there's a, sh a short gap and after the gap there's either stimulus that would be predicted for the 400 millisecond or 800 millisecond gap or it's a violation. Um, in this case you have again the movie, a break and then it's jumping too, too much forward in time. Um, again, this is an experiment we have varied in, in various dimensions, so we made this gap longer, 400 or 800 milliseconds, or 1,200, and then we place stimulus before or, or after. Um, and we scramble these different images um, and show th the same test stimulus. And um, the bottom line of those experiments is that in early visual cortex, you can see um, the response to the whole envelope. So those is the response to the nine um, stimuli, but um, the only difference is that the nine stimulus now fits to the previous um, sequence, and you see a small attenuation of the signal shown here in, in orange, which is the expectancy, the buildup of, of an expectancy and then a matching stimulus. And you can also see this in ventral V3. Um, so again, it's, uh, the response is to those uh, eight images, but one of them, uh, the last one, can be a violation of your expectation, and then you have these higher peaks, but if it's a confirmation, then you have these lower peaks. Um, if you look at the entire brain, you see medial parietal cortex, medial temporal lobe, this, this huge patch that is related to um, um, constructing scenes or analyzing scenes. Uh, Moshe Bar calls this the... the uh, s um, how does he call it? It's a, a scene processing area, and if, um, like, he does experiments in which you have a, uh, a swimming pool and an umbrella next to it, the umbrella is expected giving the context, the spatial context. Uh, but here we expand this concept by showing that it also triggers a temporal expectation and that uh, a confirmation of the signal. So if the last frame fits to the previous movie, then um, you, you see a small attenuation. So to wrap up this one, it's the same area in which, uh, you know, theory of mind, uh, prospection, remembering the future and so on are processed. And that's as far as we, we go so far for uh, predictive processing. Now, um, the, the counterfactual, you know, the, um, so you have an internal model that is created by the stimulation and this kind of feedback um, stream that is negotiating internal models to, uh, to, to predict uh, situations. But while we have this in the scanner, subjects also are mind-wandering, thinking of different things. And um, so in future experiments, I would like to capture this kind of uh, counterfactual situation that you're actually already thinking ahead. 
We have different paradigms where we see this um, mind wandering. And one I particularly want to highlight is where we have subjects moving in a virtual environment from one room to another. And um, we have a block design. In the very first block, they get a trigger whether they will move left or right. So by this, they will know by moving out of one room, which will be the room that they will move into. Uh, so it's a virtual reality they get, um, they get familiar with. And um, then we can look at the um, first situation in which they are moving out of one room, but al already anticipating the room they will come into. And uh, then in the second room, we can um, scan them. And um, they have, so to say, a history function where they came from. And um, the most crucial part is that um, we cover up one region, which is something I will show in the, uh, in, 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 in the second part of the talk, which is a paradigm we have used a lot. With the occluded region, we can read out uh, we have, so to say, silenced the feedforward input, and we can read out the internal models, the predictions. And we do use this in this paradigm to see what are the kind of internal models triggered by the, by the scene. And interestingly, we can see that while being in the first room, you already have some information about the second room you will go to, which is a natural situation if you think about it. If you move around um, and you go uh, to your office, you kind of having an expectation of the, what happens at once you open the door. And that runs with you automatically. And if you open the door and it looks like your kitchen, but it should be your office, you would be surprised. So it's this kind of prediction that you carry along that is already processed that we can read out as an internal model in this non-stimulated region, but only uh, for the future room, not for the past. So now a very simple experiment with this occlusion paradigm, amodal completion. So the, your world knowledge being projected to V1 um, in uh, situations like this. You have a coffee cup, and you have the, ha the hand behind it. You know, of course, the hand is behind it, but it's not a visual illusion. You don't see a hand coming through this coffee cup, but you, you, you know that behind this, there would be this object, OK? So we tested this by having a big occluding um, white space that's always the same. And we use brain reading to, to read out in primal visual cortex whether the surround is giving uh, consistent information into this region. So here we have an example of uh, a car, a um, boat, and, and a market scene. We do retrotopic mapping of these, this region that we occlude. This is the center part of it. We don't use the surround, which is blue, um, just to make sure that we don't have spillover. This is V3, this is V2, and this is V1. But now we sample it from different layers in cortex and use brain reading. So again, support vector machine trained on three runs, and then brain reading the fourth run. So if this works, and we only take those boxes that are in here in this part. So sanity check. If you have um, really different visual input, the classifier should be able to say in the fourth run, uh, yeah, this, is, this, looks, this activity pattern looks like the car, the steering wheel. This activity pattern looks like the ship. You have different voxes that are differently activated, and that's consistent. And uh, that's what the red line shows. It's classifier performance around ceiling, so that's 100%. That's in different layers of cortex of V1. It's always classifying. It can read out and say which of, of these visual images are shown. Now, if we occlude this, we have as feedforward input only white screen, and it can classify um, in most of the layers. But in the very outer layers, it can classify. So now, in the 10% from coming from the outside, the, the um, superficial layer, 10 and 16%, uh, now they are overlapping. Uh, we use 0 0.8 millimeter voxels in fMRI. Uh, cortex is 3 millimeter thick. So you know they are partially oversampling over each other. But in the outer layers, we, can, we get some information about the surrounding scenes. So that is different here to here. And um, 
that's where, so to say, the world knowledge is coming to as a predictive code to v1. And now we use this paradigm in, in various ways. Um, of course, in principle, that goes to your question, where is this feedback coming from? It's coming from all kinds of areas. The highest chance is it's coming from v2. The neighboring areas has 10 times more connections than others. But the, now we are doing some neuroscience with this feedback signal. We want to test, for example, the precision of this. So think of it as a receptive field mapping, but now taking the feedback signal uh, as your, your inducer. So we always keep this um, region occluded. We have energy matched stimuli. So this is a car and the market scene. And now we move them around by two degrees, by four degrees, six degrees. And we train our classifier at zero degree and then in three runs. And then in the fourth run, in the brain reading run, we move around the stimuli by two degree. If the classifier can still say, oh, that's the car scene and not the market scene, then the information that is back projected has a precision, uh, at least to some extent, bigger than two degrees. And by using this parametrically, we can map out the precision and it comes out to be somewhere around four degrees. This version, we have done this in many steps at three Tesla with bigger voxels. This is now with 70. And it shows again in the outer layer, 10 to 10%, uh, um, 26% in the top. It's only the pink line uh, that is significantly able to decode, cross decode from zero to two, um, this smallest step. If it's from zero to eight degrees or from two to eight degrees, it's too big. Information is not consistent enough. So the precision of this top-down process is somewhere around four degrees. We tested something else, and that is the spatial frequency envelope. So if we train the classifier only in, in these scenes, only with high resolution, is it capable of having uh, consistent information here and here? Or if we train it only on low spatial frequency, the idea is that the internal models are processed only in low spatial frequency. They're kind of a just a first estimate in low spatial frequency. Moshe Bar, for example, has proposed this. We find the same predictions in both envelopes, and they are partially overlapping also. So it goes, the feedback is in high and in low spatial frequency. So now we um, look into explaining what is the superficial information that we can read out, where is this coming from? And in a collaboration with Matthew Larkham in, Chris in Berlin and Christian Liefeld in Amsterdam, they have rerun uh, our same experiment now in rodents with two-photon um, imaging, you can see that here, uh, calcium imaging at different depth layers of cortex. And um, Matthew Larkham, this is sensory stimulation showing how important it is in rodents, the cortical feedback of the layer five pyramidal cells can be the key role player in making something conscious or not conscious. So uh, this is a bit of a background. If you stimulate the whiskers uh, and do the recording um, below or above threshold, this, the stimulation, the rodent is trained to respond whenever they feel the tickle. And um, the, ones, the runs in which there were misses, the, it was the apical dendrites in the superficial layer that didn't have activity. The feed-forward input that comes to layer four, more proximal, um, is not making the difference. It's in the, in the superficial layers that differentiates hits and misses. And they went further to activate or deactivate the apical dendrites. And by this, you can shift the sensitivity of the rodent. So if you activate it, it's responding earlier to stimulation of the, uh, to, to weaker stimulation. And if you inactivate, the apical dendrites, it's less responding. And those is a sub part of, of layer five pyramidal cells that they specifically target with, with their paradigm. Um, now, M Christian Liefeld, in a collaborator in the Human Brain Project in our work package, has now used our paradigm. So this is rodent, uh, uh, rodent uh, cage, uh, uh, simple stimulus and other complex stimulus of the outside scene. This is the res receptive field of the neurons that are measured here. 
uh, they are looking into the visual field and they are still so they are stimulated feed forwardly and this is the calcium channel activity that you can read out from this dentri dentritic apical uh, um, signal that are specifically marked and now they occlude, occlude this part so there's no feed forward input and the question is do you still see in the superficial layers input activity and that's the kind of activity they find uh, at, at two different depth levels so the tuft and the apical uh, dendrites th th they are still both in the superficial layer so what we show here in the red they show here in both of those images and there's some activity in response to changes in the surround stimulus. So from this we conclude that um, our, our stimulus, that what we're measuring in part in our occluded paradigm is kind of a cortical feedback to these apical dendrites. And now I'm just gonna wrap up um, with, the, with the last experiment. So here I only showed like uh, three different stimuli, but now we upscale this to 24 stim stimuli. In, in the Human Brain Project, we also scaled it now to more than 300 images. Um, and I'm just going to show the, so this is, you know, we present the subjects. This is 3T. Um, and the new one we have, again, layer specific. This is kind of a heat map of activity showing where classifiers get the information from in V1 and V2. Um, this is a representational similarity analysis of the activity in the occluded part, in the non-occluded part. So this is feed-forward information from, from here for the different scenes. There were mountains and offices and so on. And the diagonal tells you how specific this activity pattern is for this particular stimulus. And this bigger patch shows you for the whole um, category so forests look alike um, but the other ones yeah so this is the kind of uh, activity dissimilarity of those scenes for feed forward and for feedback you also see a diagonal so that say tells you there's some specific information there might also be some categorial information so the forest and v1 look all a little bit similar in the in their feedback uh, these are computational models none of those computation if a computational model would be perfect like an HMAX model or a GIST for the occluded or the non-occluded, it would match to those dissimilarities and explain them. And none of them really explain them very well. Um, and we are particularly interested in the, non, in the occluded information here. Do we have a model for that? Do we have a good explanation? So we haven't so far. So we looked into behavior uh, and asked the subjects, if you see the scene, uh, draw in the missing information. And the line drawings are very consistent across subjects. Uh, so this is 20 subjects average. They come across, they, they come out in the same way. The first line drawings all do the same, same kind of thing. And if you um, filter these images to line drawings, you can see that the, the, the filled in information fits very good, this line drawing. And if we go back to compare the line, so the, the line drawings are not perfect. They leave out some details, right? The bridge is totally missing here in the line drawing. And what we did wrong before, we looked in our models and we had this rich information, the, the bridge, so to say, trying to, as a predictor for our feedback signal, and that didn't match. But if we make models of the line drawings, then uh, here are models of the line drawings then in V1 and V2, and that's the noise ceiling shown here, then some of those models, like the GIST model of a line drawing, is already very close to our um, internal model as measured from uh, V1 activity in this occluded region using support vector machine. So the, the, the bottom line of this is that we think in these occluded scenes, what the brain is doing for us is having a kind of a a line drawing with a precision um, somewhere around a few degrees um, and and that is kind of a, a, a map or a, a, um, a landmark where it's marking positions uh, things should go uh, uh, kind of landmarks and they are very consistent across the different um, different subjects I'm not going to this model now for time and let me just summarize and 
wrap up. So what we have shown is uh, in various experiments that we have a proof of principle that there is some um, traces of internal models that we can map out with using uh, brain imaging. We have shown this in apparent motion. We have shown this in scenes, in, in scenes that were occluded or scenes that were moving. Um, and we have used multi-scale, multi-species um, approach. So we can see some of this replicated in rodents when they see visual scenes in which parts are occluded. We can say something about the mechanism. So the feedback amplifies and disamplifies predicted information. Uh, that's something we showed in the apparent motion. It's happening in the superficial layers of V1. Uh, in humans and in rodents, it has a precision around uh, four degrees. It's fast enough to sustain eye movements. Um, so after the eye movement, it still works. It is destroyed, the predictive signal, by TMSing V5, for example, supporting the hierarchy assumption. Um, we have now models of the feedback signal to V1 that are captured in line drawings. Uh, um, we have um, some across spatial frequency generalization. So we have measured the feedback signal to be uh, of high spatial frequency and or on low spatial frequency, and there's a bit of a crosstalk. Um, in the scenario in which the, we used the virtual reality and subjects were moving through this environment, we could see that the predictive code is already from the next room and not from the current room. Um, and there are applications for, in principle, for different um, clinical um, scenarios, for example, in aging, in uh, mood disorder, in autism, in schizophrenia, where the negotiations of internal models with the input could be altered, could be different in its spatial and or temporal resolution, which is things that might be tested in future. Um, and we have done, I skipped over this, some computational models using deep encoding networks that we now add with a feedback stream um, in this U-shape models that give predictions and how that fills in the missing piece of information. And, uh, yeah. and with this, I thank my lab. I highlight um, s some of the key players. So um, Tyler, Andrew, he has done the, the 24 different scenes that I showed in the, in the end. Um, and uh, Michele is doing the deep encoding networks. And uh, the, the earlier examples are from alumni that have already left the, the lab. Um, yeah, and I also showed some HPP contribution. So uh, the lab of Rainer Goebel, the first fMRI studies that we did with a layer specific fMRI was done in Minneapolis with the help of uh, Federico Di Martino. And uh, the rodent examples I showed are from Christian Liefeld's lab and uh, Matthew Larkham's lab. So I, I'm sorry for, I, I took some questions in between, so now we only have a little bit of time for questions. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> okay. <coughs>